God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. Welcome to Unapologetic. I am so thrilled to have marriage expert, best-selling author, speaker, and pastor Gary Thomas on the show today. Gary is the author of 20 books that have sold over 2 million copies. Plus, he's a teaching pastor and speaker known across the country and around the world. Gary's newest book, Making Your Marriage a Fortress, is all about how we can strengthen our marriages to withstand whatever comes our way in life. Whether you've been married for 5 years or 50 years, you know that trials aren't an if, but a when in marriage. And Making Your Marriage a Fortress has all the practical insights and biblical truth to help you with whatever comes your way. This is a very practical and encouraging conversation. We specifically talk about how to stay close in those early years of parenthood. We talk about empty nest syndrome, and we also hit on what to do if your marriage faces infidelity. Please help me welcome to the show, Gary Thomas. Hi, Gary. How are you? Hi, Julia. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. I want to ask you the question I ask all of our guests. What do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? The the commands and directives of Scripture. I believe Scripture is a miracle. Jesus said not to be ashamed of him or his words, and I believe he speaks his words through the apostles. And the older I get, Julia, I'm much further down the road than you are the more I realize that every one of God's commands are birthed in love and grace and mercy and compassion. He's telling us the best way to live. We don't need to explain them away. We need to surrender and obey. I have uh, come to a very spiritual conclusion that everyone basically cares about themselves. Like that's my conclusion after my first decade in ministry with my husband. Um, But the reason I say that kind of jokingly is I think whenever we hear sermons, we hear, we read Bible stories. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to know how does this apply to me and what I'm going through right now? And I'm just not sure that everyone knows, like the majority knows, how many biblical commands and help there is in Scripture for marriage. And so I'm excited to talk to you about this today. We know after the pandemic, divorce rates are soaring and that couples are having a harder time than normal. And your new book is, do you, can you tell us about your new book? Yeah, it's called uh, Making Your Marriage a Fortress. And it's all about how your marriage can grow through the storms of life instead of become weaker. This isn't a world that is kind toward marriages. It's not a world that supports marital commitment, certainly not lifelong marital commitment. It seems like it throws curveball after curveball at us, trying to strike us out and get us to quit. And so this book is really just a collection of couples who have faced some really tough things, but with great wisdom and great faith, have found that those things that have torn so many couples apart actually serve to grow their marriage. God used it to help them get closer together. And so it's recognizing the the power of God to bring us together, even in the midst of what feels like chaos and cruelty. Yeah. I just think so much, of course, about the verse, what God has joined, let no man separate. But that's really a decision to decide ahead of time. Um, would you do you agree with that? I, I know I found that true in our life. We've been we're coming up on 14 years married. It's easier to decide before there's a problem, like we are gonna stay together instead of kind of deciding <laughs> whenever there are we're facing trials. I, I think that's the right attitude, Julia, because it, it puts you in a whole different mindset. How do we use this to grow closer together? Now I know you as a mother of triplets knows how crazy certain seasons of life can be like with newborns. Not too many people know what it's like to raise three newborns at the same time. But what I've often encouraged couples is that when they bring a new child into the house, which will will create a new marriage, I'm using a quote from Dr. Les Parrott to explain that. But but their first the first goal as a couple should be this, 20 years from now, 
we will be closer as a couple. We want to be more in love as a couple. We want to be more committed in our marriage than we are today. And, and while I believe that a, a life of faith and worship in the presence of God is the most important thing we can provide our children, a husband and wife who cherish each other, love each other, and make each other a priority is the second best thing that we can give to our children. I think otherwise we tend to focus on, you know, the, the physical well-being, the educational well-being, and yet when we let that get in the way and our marriages drift, we can give our kids one of the greatest damages of their life, which would be a marriage that is torn apart growing up in a broken home. Right. And I, I just want to ask you about this because I, I grew up, of course, in Christian culture, and there was so much emphasis, of course, on staying together. But just from what I, how I grew up and the speakers I would hear, it really was just the emphasis of staying together um, when we know if you're together, but the whole family is unhappy and arguing and traumatizing the kids, but at least they're together. Um, that can cause a lot of damage too. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Right. Absolutely. The same Bible that urges us not to pursue divorce also condemns violence. Uh, there are many times, not just physical bi violence, but emotional violence, verbal violence. So when we accept all of Scripture as God breathed, we recognize that while um, we need to not use divorce as a solution for difficult marriages, I think it's different when you're looking at abusive marriages. God hates to see violence take place even within the home. And then I wrote another book a few years back called Cherish, where I believe just exactly what you said was the issue that we were defining a marriage quantitatively. We're, it's a Christian marriage because we're still together. But I believe God wants Christian marriages to be marked by the qualitative difference that we don't just love each other. We learn what it means to cherish each other so that somebody looks at a Christian marriage and says, I've never seen a man love his wife like that, or I've never seen a woman love her husband like that. The way they talk about each other, the way they serve each other. They're not in contention with each other, but they model the reconciliation message of they're thrilled to be together. And that models the reconciliation of God reconciling the world to himself. And so I'm, I'm complete agreement that while a Christian marriage should be marked by its loyalty and faithfulness, i.e. the quantity aspect, just as much we need to grow the quality aspect of our marriage and i think that's done by pursuing a cherishing attitude toward each other mm, that is so good and it's hard to do that in certain seasons i have heard lots of christian couples that i've talked to they're they're definitely not raising their hand in sunday school and admitting this um but w would you say that there are seasons where you are more likely to struggle with um, the idea of divorce. I know in therapy, I learned um, when I was becoming a counselor that seven to 10 year mark. Have Is that a real thing or is that just a movie, the seven year itch? It, that, that That's a big thing. I've surprised some couples when they come into my office as a pastor. I'm not a therapist. People will come in for pastoral counseling sometimes though. And uh, before they even say it, I'll find out how long they've been married how old their kids are. And I said, I bet this is your issue. And they look at me like I'm some mystic. And I'm like, right. no, I've just worked yeah. with a lot of married couples and this is pretty predictable. Another very common time is what they call gray divorce. Right after the last child leaves, many couples will say together until the child rearing is over. And then they say, you know what, we've grown so far apart. And yet a friend of mine did his doctoral thesis on how divorce for adult kids can be even more impactful than divorcing when the kids are young. Um, and so we don't want to just look at ourselves as teammates raising kids. And then once raising kids is over, the season's over and our marriage is over. That actually is one of the worst things we can do for our kid. I, I felt challenged by God that I am to love my wife like I want my uh, would want my daughter's husbands to love them so they could see yeah. this is what I should look for and to model to my son, this is the way you love your wife. And if you and your husband are cherishing each other, the way you talk to each other, the way you pay attention to each other, the the the, the friendly taps and pats, that that isn't missed. And it feeds our kids' souls. 
We've been in student ministry for a long time. I know I've told you, I told you that. And I remember we went to a conference one year and it was really whenever the studies started coming out about Christian teenagers leaving the faith after graduation, leaving the church. And every, every obviously everyone was very concerned. And we went to this conference and I remember he was this like expert in youth ministry. He said, Parents need to create a home that the kids want to replicate, not one they want to run from. And that was such an interesting idea to us because we were like, okay, we want to help them choose to follow God's commands because they enjoyed their house growing up. They enjoyed their family and their home. I want them to choose marriage because they enjoyed what they saw. Not that everything's awesome. Um, but I thought that that was really neat that that was identified as one reason that kids pick something different. So after saying that, parents listening obviously are like, oh no, like <laughs> thinking about what they've done or said in front of their kids. Can you give some advice for just how we can fix things with our children whenever we do mess up or act in a less than wonderful way? Yeah. Well, the word I'm sorry goes a long way. Mm -hmm. We're modeling repentance. We're modeling asking for forgiveness. We're modeling the fact that there's only one hero and that's Jesus. And parents need Jesus as much as the kids do so often. We make it seem like we've arrived and we just want our kids to behave and grow. I think it's a wonderful gift to your kids to see, you know what? God is working on me. I'm convicted by his spirit. I didn't respond to you in the appropriate way, or you shouldn't have seen me treat your mom that way. I've asked her forgiveness. I've asked God's forgiveness. I believe he'll give me the power to change. I'm asking for your forgiveness too. I, I think you're just modeling the real Christian life when you do that. Oh, that's so good. I wanted to ask you real quick, because it's like, I just have so many things I want to talk to you about, but can you share, um, you talked about two different times where couples really get that itch to separate or divorce. Can you, uh, let's start with the first season. It's about the seven to 10 year mark or whenever you have young kids. Can you talk about a way to kind of work past that? I, I would go back to what I said earlier, Julia, that I think you have to get together as husband and wife and say, we're excited about raising this child, but our first goal is that this will help our marriage grow, not pull us apart. Now, ideally, both husband and wife will share the burden and sacrifices of child rearing. We'll see it as a joint thing. But I've seen sometimes husbands feel like, I've lost my wife to our child. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even count. It's almost like, okay, you gave me what I want, this beautiful child. I've never experienced a love like this. Just yeah. leave us alone, pay for mm -hmm. the bills. But, but other than that, we don't need mm -hmm. you. And that doesn't go over very well. So it's accepting that our, our marriage will feed our children spiritually. And we don't look, I, I've become an empty nester now with my wife. And I, I want the encouragement that you can look forward to is that we found the empty nest years to be some of the most treasured years of our marriage. We can focus on each other. We have more time. We have more energy. It would have been terrifying if when we were entering those empty nest years, we were strangers and we didn't know right. each other. So I think you make that commitment. Second, we, we need to say no to some things. I'll often say to new, newly pregnant uh, couples. So what are you going to take out? And look, what, what are you I said, okay, a baby's going to be born, but God doesn't give you 30 more hours a week to take care <laughs> of that child, but it's yeah. going to take about that long. And, and so often they don't think ahead of time. Okay. What, what are we cutting out? How are we going to be, where are we going to find this time? They don't have a clue how much work it is. Right. And I think when you look back, You'll regret more growing distance from your child, whatever the reason was, than if you give up something to be with your children, to keep your family alive. And then after the season of parenting is over, you can go back. You can play golf more often now. You can you know, watch the sports teams more. But I, I think it's really just making it a priority, being conscientious about the choice. What are my priorities in life with, with God, my marriage? and my children, and then I got to fit the other stuff in for, 
after that. Yeah, that's interesting because that's such a different message than what's out there right now. And I've, I've talked about this a lot on the show. It's now we know a lot about postpartum depression, anxiety, in general, the postpartum year and motherhood. But it seems like the pendulum is like swung to the other side and it's all about, well, make sure you're healthy healthy, make sure you're taking care of yourself, make sure you don't lose yourself. And it just almost seems like we're too far that way. I know my generation is, and it's very much leave your kids so that you can be with your friends and leave your kids with the babysitter so you can do whatever. Not that you can never do that, but we are supposed to sacrifice. We are supposed to be laying down our lives for our kids. Um, That seems to kind of be a generational switch a little bit. I want to ask you about something um, that I've talked to um, different just millennials about. A lot of them don't seem to know that there are seasons. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about being alive in 2022 is we have books, we have experts on marriage and family. And when you know a season, it's just like winter. When you know this is going to end eventually and summer's coming again, it helps you get through the winter. And I was talking to a friend and they're like, this is just like, we don't like each other. We don't like, this is not working out. And I'm like, it's, it's a season. Like it's not always going to be like this. And that's something like Ryan and I, we had this really weird situation because it was amazing. Like it was everything we'd ever prayed for, but it was extremely difficult. And we would just look at each other and say, hey, it's not always going to be this way. Let's just have fun, make the most of it and realize like this is hard. Like we're in a hard time right now. And that kind of gave permission just to say we don't have to pretend like this is so easy and we're just loving every second. It gave us permission just to say this is hard. And so we need to make sure that we're on um, defense and that we're staying close to God be- and not giving Satan a foothold. We, when you have babies, that's one kind of hard because you don't have a lot of sleep. You don't have much free time. They kind of set the schedule. When you have babies and toddlers, that's just exhausting. It's a different kind of when, when you then graduate from the diaper bag and you can go somewhere without packing all of that stuff. That creates a different kind mm-hmm. of freedom. I'll never forget right after my wife and I became empty nesters. Um, it was it was kind of amazing because I we were in Houston at the time in the summer and I was determined to get this run in. And it was one of those brutal, hot, humid days in Houston. And I went farther than I should have and was really hurting coming back. And my wife noticed that I should have been back by now and she got concerned So she filled up a water bottle. She brought a towel. She went on her bike. She knew what trail I would be taking on. And she met me. And I was kind of laughing. I mean, she's being so thoughtful and caring and kind. But if that would have happened when she was homeschooling three kids and had a golden retriever, a very needy golden retriever at home, uh, I would have left for a run and come back. And she probably said, oh, you went for a run? I mean, she just wouldn't have noticed. (laughs) That's when I knew our marriage was different. And that's where I would say particularly um, to husbands, have empathy. It is a lot of work. It's it's a lot of focus. And what Julie just said is 100% true. There are different seasons of marriage. Every marriage has a different season of different joys and different challenges. And and sometimes you, you just endure those seasons. And that sounds terrible sometimes and maybe not even Christian. But when I've walked with couples that are going through cancer treatments, or, or things that are just as difficult, they just have to endure it. I mean, there's not a lot of fun. There's not a lot of romance. There, there's a lot of concern and worry and anxiety. And, and so it's like that where those are seasons where we have to persevere. The Bible talks a lot about perseverance. James says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So there will be seasons in your marriage and in your parenting where you just have to persevere, but God is doing great things in the midst of that perseverance. I want to ask about this because I am now the age we're past. Most of my friends are not newlyweds. And it's kind of, I I told Ryan the other day, I was like, wow, like this is kind of the first round of people, unfortunately, getting divorced. The first friend that I had get divorced 
I remember thinking, like, I thought it was going to be, like, years long of them trying to work things out or go to counseling. And I remember it was just very immediate. And the first thing I thought was, and she had biblical grounds, but the first thing I thought was, wow, she hasn't heard enough stories. She hasn't heard enough stories of redemption and reconciliation. And just to be clear, of course, that's not always possible. But can you just kind of share, I know that, of course, you've worked with many couples that have um, faced infidelity and just what, what really to do whenever your spouse has been unfaithful. Well, in, in making a marriage a fortress, there are three different stories where couples had affairs. One was the wife had affair, two where the husband had an affair. What made it possible for them to get together and now say they have a marriage of their dreams, even though the husband and wife or the wife had an affair, they admitted there was a time when they hated each other. They they were so they were just yelling that we might as well get a divorce. We don't want to be there. And one said, I'm done. The other one said, Good. I'm glad. I'm I'm done with this too. And yet today, they, they act like kids with a school crush on each other. They're delirious. So I just want to say to couples, God can do that. But here was the, the common denominator. There, were, there was a repentant spouse. Right. Re- repentance isn't just tears. Repentance is demonstrated acts. And so one of the husbands who had had an affair, when he was found out, he thought it was the worst day of his life. He looks back and say it was one of the best. He got into a 12-step program and was serious. He went to the famous uh, 30 meetings in 30 days. He was meeting with mentors. He was making the phone calls, listening to the podcasts, reading the books. Even, they have this in Houston, went through quarterly lie detector tests where his wife could ask him anything. So he knew the days of lying were over. He would be caught. And with that security, the wife felt like eventually there was a time of separation that I think was needed. Okay, you can come back. I think we can rebuild on this. And and she's very glad they did. It's a different situation when somebody is repeatedly unfaithful and they're not demonstrating repentance. In fact, they're even defensive saying, why don't you trust me? And I would say, well, she'd be foolish to trust you right now. Trust has to be rebuilt. You've right. broken that. Tr- you lied to her. How does she know you're not lying to you now? A repentant spouse. I, I think of what Terry said. She was the woman who had the affair and her husband kept grilling her, almost like an attorney, trying to find a hole in her story. And she just said in a beautiful way, David, you've asked me that question a hundred times in different ways, but I'll keep answering it another hundred times different times. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I put you in this situation. And I want to show you uh, I'm, I'm here. That ended it for him. He said, I've got my wife back. I trust her. Mm-hmm. Intimacy was rebuilt and they have a great marriage. So if, if, if the spouse who was the offender doesn't get defensive, if they demonstrate repentance and they're proving it by their actions, marriages can be rebuilt. I, I don't fault those spouses because I Look, I've worked with some as a couple where a husband in 10 years of marriage was never really faithful to his wife, maybe a month or two at a time. And when it became apparent that he just was not going to be, um, I I believe Jesus gives that spouse an out and I'm not going to take away what Jesus offers. Yeah, I, I think it depends probably what community you're in if you and what church you're in, if you regularly regularly hear stories of restoration or not. It's um, So if I think that that's something I know that, you know, it's not the same situation, but whenever we we're facing um, infertility and miscarriages, like I didn't really know anyone who had been in that situation. So I read stories about how couples stayed close and how they overcame. And so just realizing there's something so powerful about stories of hope. But of course, the Bible does make allowance, of course, for, for divorce in cases of infidelity. I want to ask, um, as we're wrapping up, what is, sorry to put you on the spot, what is your number one best marriage advice as we're wrapping up today? Uh, I think the one that influenced me most was one time that uh, I, I was praying for my wife. I had not been the best of husbands. This was rather early on in our marriage. I felt God challenging me saying, Gary, Lisa isn't just your wife. She's my daughter. And I expect you to treat her accordingly. 
And Julie, when I think of all that I owe God, the fact that I exist is because God created me. He, he saved me by his grace. I know where I'm going so I can enjoy life. I've got his Holy Spirit to convict me when I sin. I would ruin my life without the power of the Spirit to convict me and then call me out of my sin and give me the strength to surrender to God and, and be obedient to God. Think of all that I owe God. And then he says to me, Gary, here's my daughter. Will you love her? out of reverence for me. At that point, how my wife acts is almost irrelevant in the sense of I owe God, her heavenly father, so much. Loving his daughter is so important that nothing could matter as much as that. So I start thinking of God, not just as my heavenly father, but my heavenly (laughs) father-in-law. And and, and thinking on it in that term, in, in those terms, has helped me love my wife as an act of worship. The reality is, Julia, that whoever's listening and they're married, the Bible tells me in James 3, 2, that we all stumble in many ways. Nobody gets to marry the fourth member of the Trinity. That person doesn't exist. (laughs) Right? We're, We're marrying somebody that we know the Bible promises us is going to stumble, not just occasionally, but in many ways, how do you maintain motivation to keep loving a spouse who isn't always lovable? The way we do that is loving out of reverence for a perfect God who doesn't sin, who has given us everything that we value most. And so I I think this notion of living with the sense that God is my heavenly father in law has impacted my marriage more than anything else, because I I think marriage is at least 50 percent motivation. If I used to wake up as a young husband and it's like, am I being happy in my marriage? Is my wife treating me well? How can I convince my wife to do this or not do that or or whatnot? Now I like to end the days praying to my heavenly father. Have I pleased you with the way I've loved your daughter today? Have I served her in a way that brings you joy? I owe you everything. What can I do to show my love for you by loving your daughter? Wow. That is powerful. Okay. So everyone's like running to get your book right now. Can you tell us how to stay connected with you and your ministry and where to find your books? Yeah. The two main places uh, where I'm interacting most is on Substack, where I write a lot on marriage. We have videos, we have blog posts and excerpts and whatnot. And then my website is just my name, Julia. It's GaryThomas.com. That lists all of my books uh, there's old posts that are there and whatnot, um, and it shows where I'm speaking next. Thank you so much for being on the show today. This was just gold information for couples and for those that are going to be married one day. Thank you so much for your ministry and your influence. Well, thank you, Julie. It's a delight to talk to you. I, I love to talk to younger couples and, and, and just hear people being faithful to the Lord and each other and those three precious children that you have. Thanks for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts.